What's up, church? How we doing, everybody? Man, I love you guys so much. I, I love our church. Just the best church. I really am so thankful for you, and thank you for being here. Uh, I want to take a minute. I want to welcome everybody who's watching right now online via the interwebs, and of course, everybody who's over at that South Side, South Campus. South Campus, we love you. And the best way we can show you is by clapping. So come on, everybody. Will you clap for that person sitting next to you? And watching with us. Oh, man. Uh, just a great day today. Last week, we talked about uh, Vision Sunday. Such a great day. Talking about what God has and all that God's doing. And, man, I'm just so thankful to be a part of a church where God is on the move. And uh, he's helping us. And we're getting ready to move into our new building in Jesus' name. Hopefully praying that by Easter, Easter Sunday would be our first Sunday in our new building. So. But we got to pray, okay? We got to pray because there's all kinds of uh, supply chain issues and all kinds of construction equipment things that uh, we just need to pray. But how many know God is a way maker, okay? He can make a way where there is no way. So, and we're going to pray for that. And it's a, it's, it's a great time. Um, I want to take a minute. Many of you know we are doing uh, our one-year Bible reading as a church. So uh, we're going through a, a book called The One-Year Bible. It's just a Bible reading plan. And it has, some of them have their own, like, paperback versions or hardback versions. Or you can do this also online. But we're going through the one-year Bible, which is really, really strong. And I can just sense the church growing and learning and engaging. And it's just, it's just powerful. And the, the one-year Bible, what's cool about it is it has an Old Testament passage, a New Testament passage, a psalm, and a proverb. And so you're going through the whole Bible in one year. And so you're covering all these different themes. And it's just really, really, it's just really, really good. Except when you get to Leviticus. <laughs> All right, so some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, which is where we are right now as a church. We are in Leviticus. And if you're reading along with us in the one year Bible, um, you're reading about sores, you're reading about skin, skin diseases, and you're like, he did, you know, they did what with what? Like, you're reading some stuff, <laughs> and you're like, what is going on here? Um, I want to give you a resource because some of you are like, I don't know. I just, I can't read any more skin diseases. I just can't do it. Um, I want to give you a resource that will help you put all of the books of the Bible into perspective. And one of the things we talked about at the beginning of the year when we covered the Bible as, in, as a topic in one of our messages, we talked about how the Bible is one continual story. It's not, it's not a bunch of different stories. It's one continual story of the redemptive love of God. And so every book in the Bible has its place in showing us the goodness of God even Leviticus. And so there's a resource that I want to show you. It's called the Bible Project. All right, we're going to throw that up on the screen there. Take a picture of that. Write that down. If you've never checked out any of the Bible Project videos, they're amazing. And what they do is they give you context for what that book of the Bible is going to be talking about, uh, the, the background of it, the writers of it, how it ties in to the overall story of redemption. The Bible Project is an amazing resource. You've got to check it out, all right? It will help you. It will help you grow. It will help you understand this. And, um, and, I, and I promise you, even Leviticus will make sense uh, after a while. So turn to someone and say, you got to check it out. Come on, tell someone, you got to check it out. Got to check it out. Um, well, what I'm very excited about today. Uh, we're starting a brand new series called Miracles, and I've been praying for this for a long time because I really believe that miracles are an important part of the life of a believer. And one of the things I've thought about as I've been getting ready for this series is, is the idea I used to be able to do that. Have you ever heard somebody uh, say that, I used to be able to do that? Usually someone of uh, middle age nature and older referring back to their glory days. You ever heard somebody say that? You know, when I was younger, I, I, I was like, oh, geez, come on, give me a break. But you know what? I'm saying that now. I'm saying I used to be able to do that. Uh, well, I think one of the best versions of the I used to be able to do that is from Napoleon Dynamite. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> Uncle Rico sitting on the porch talking about his glory days back in football. You guys remember this? It's worthy of a Google search after church. 
<laughs> but he's sitting there and he's talking to Kip and he's like, he's like, he's talking about how he used to be able, you know, he was in the football team, but coach didn't put him in in the fourth quarter. And man, if coach just would have done that, oh man, it would have been, but he's like, man, I used to be able to, I used to be able to throw this football quarter mile, <laughs> which of course he could not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then he starts talking to Kip about a time machine and if he could just go back. And he's just reliving those glory days. I used to be able to do that. I, I've started saying this now, and it's really, really sad. It's really sad. I've started saying I used to be able to do that. And uh, because what I used to be able to do is I used to be able to stay up late with my friends playing ping pong till 1, 2 in the morning, eating pizza, eating ice cream with no regard for my body at all. <laughs> I'd wake up the next day early and do the whole thing again, day after day, week after week. Now if I do that, I'm gone for a week. <laughs> gone. Like, like just not, I won't, not putting sentences together. <laughs> words, you know, words not coming out right. Uh, when, now when I drive by Andy's, I used to be able to Andy's anytime I wanted. The limit for going to Andy's was finances, <laughs> not health. Now, now it's like, how much time on the treadmill do I want to spend? You know, that's, you literally, it's just, I used to be able to do that. I used to be able to do that. When, when it comes to miracles, when it comes to the idea of miracles, Christianity used to be able to do that. Christianity used to be able to do that. Um, and then somewhere along the way, we've lost the value of miracles. We've lost the, the, the the uh, prominence of miracles, we, we've missed it. And I want to talk about this because Christianity, like what we believe, what you all are here for, what you're watching online at the South Campus, what we're all here for is Christianity, right? Yeah, I mean, this isn't a concert. This isn't a, just a talk. Like this is, this is Christianity. And our origin is the miraculous, right? Our origin is the miraculous, we believe that God spoke words and everything that we know as natural took place. Like that the universe was created because God spoke. That was the miraculous. Now, you go to the Old Testament and you look through the Old Testament and it's one miracle after another, right? You've got God, he's parting seas, he's bringing walls down, he's empowering Samson to take on the Philistines, he's strengthening David to take down Goliath, he's bringing fire down for Elijah, he's calming fire down for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he's doing miracle after miracle after miracle. There were moments in the Old Testament when God would come and pour out his spirit, and there'd be a miracle that would be worked, just moment after moment after moment. But what happens in the New Testament is, guess what, that doesn't stop that actually progresses. It exponentially increases. Those moments become a movement. The moments of miracles become a movement of miracles in the New Testament. Jesus shows up. His birth is foretold for centuries, miraculously. And he fits the bill, all of these unique things that there's no way one person could do. And he fits it perfectly. Then at his birth, there's a multitude of angels. Pfft power, amazing, miraculous. Then when he starts his teaching ministry, he, he gathers his disciples and he starts going. He's, he's going from town to town. He's telling people about the good news of Jesus. He's talking, but you know what else he's doing? He's performing miracles. I mean, it's hard to read the gospels without reading one miracle after another miracle, after another miracle, after another miracle. He does miracles one right after another. And then and then you go to the New Testament. You got these apostles, these disciples. Spirit comes down at Pentecost, poof, pours out, and they're doing the miraculous. It's you get a miracle, you get a miracle, you get a miracle. Way before Oprah ever showed up. <laughs> God is and has been in the business of doing the miraculous. So, a couple questions. Number one why? Why all the miracles? And number two, where'd they all go? Two questions, right? Have you ever thought about that? 
Like, you're like, no, not until you just said that, but now that I am, yeah, now I am. Now you just said that. Why all the miracles and where they all go? So I want to do a little bit of a teaching today, and this is going to lay like a groundwork for our series. Uh, so I want, to, I want to show you why all the miracles, and then I want to show you why we may be missing out on some of them today, and then we're going to pray that we'll begin to see them in new ways here and now. We're actually going to pray for people at the end of service, and so... And we're going to do this every service during our miracle series. And if you have a miracle that you need, we're going to believe that the God of miracles will do a miracle for you. Yeah, come on. Yeah, faith is rising. I love it. Okay, so let me give you, I want to answer first of all, why all the miracles? Three reasons why all the miracles back in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and today. Number one, God is always on the move. Number two, God wants to grow our faith. And number three, God wants us to walk in power. So he's always on the move. He wants to grow our faith, and he wants us to walk in power. We're going to cover these three, three things, and then at the end, we're going to cover what's inhibiting us to experience them, and then we're going to believe God to do something great. Before we do, find three people next to you and just say, hey, 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 God's got a miracle for you. Come on, tell three people. Say, hey, 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 God's got a miracle for you. He does. Number one, why all the miracles in the Old Testament? Why all the miracles in the New Testament? Why all the miracles now or should we be experiencing? Number one is God is always on the move. He's always on the move. One of my favorite verses, it's it's an often overlooked verse. Genesis chapter one, verse two. says, now the earth was formless and empty Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering. Everybody say hovering. Hovering. It's hovering over the waters. Now, the the word hovering there is the word rahab, and it means tremble, to move gently, or to brood. Everybody say brood. I like that word. I think brood's a fun word. It it kind of likes to fight a little bit, you know? Someone's brooding. Like they're like, they likes to fight, you know, they likes to fight guy. That's kind of, but not, Jesus doesn't want to fight. Jesus wants to help. But the spirit of God at the beginning, hovering over the waters, moving, trembling, moving gently, brooding, getting ready to do something amazing. From the very beginning of scripture, God was on the move. Then what happens right after that? Creation. God, so the spirit's hovering and then creation. So God was moving, and God moved. That's what happens. And then he, he makes everything that we know is natural happen, but he does it supernaturally. When God does something natural, it's supernatural. God's nature is supernatural. Does that make sense? So when God does something It's supernatural. You ever know somebody, like every time you're around that person, when you're around them, they're going to do what they do because that's who they are? Maybe it's a friend. They're always going to say that joke or they're always going to laugh that way or whatever it is. They're going to do that because it's who they are. When God does something natural, it's supernatural. When he moves, it's amazing. He's always on the move and it's always powerful. And that's, that's why when you are in a relationship with God, so if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you said, God, I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to start moving in your direction. I'm going to turn from myself and I'm going to turn towards you. You are now connected supernaturally to the supernatural wonder working God. That's amazing. It's amazing. It's like, it's like plugging into a power source. It's like a lamp at your house. You have a nice lamp at your house, in your living room. You're like, oh, man, it's such a nice lamp. How many of you know it doesn't work unless it's plugged in? But once you plug that lamp in to the power source, now it is giving light. It's connected to the power source, and it is bringing light to it. That's you and me. We're connected to the power source, and because we are, we can experience the supernatural, and we can let the supernatural happen through us. 
Well, John thought it was good. John thought it was good. It is good. Let me just tell you this. This is so important. This is so important when, when it comes to Christianity. Because Christianity today, for a lot of churches and for a lot of Christians, has just become about what you do, how you live, and what you give back. Now, I believe in all of those things. I believe in all those things. We preach on those things. It's important to live and to honor God. It's important to do things for the Lord, to demonstrate our faith. It's important to treat each other kindly. Absolutely. But you know what's actually much more important? Not about what you do, but about what God does. And God wants to move. So the spirit at the beginning who was brooding, he's like, let's go. Let's do something. I can't wait. He's still brooding. He still wants to move. He still wants to work and strengthen and do the miraculous. This is the normal response for being connected to God. It's a normal response. So God's always on the move. That's the first thing. Second thing is that God wants to grow our faith. So why miracles? Because God wants to grow your faith. Look at what happens in John's gospel at the end of Jesus' ministry. Jesus, in, in John's gospel specifically, there are seven main signs that, that John focuses on. He doesn't cover all the miracles that Jesus does. In fact, he says that at the end of his gospel, he says, man, if, if we recorded everything that Jesus did, I don't even know if there'd be enough room in the whole world for all the books that you would need. So, so he says this. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe. Everybody say believe. believe. Come on, with strength, say believe. 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 God wants you to believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. See, God wants to do something amazing for you. God wants to do a miraculous sign. He wants to do a healing work. He wants to touch your marriage. He wants to provide for you financially in an undeniable way so that when you step back, you're going to be like, only God. And then as you believe in God, you have the life of God. See, God wants you to have life. He doesn't want you to be a boring believer. Come on, somebody. We talked about this a few weeks ago. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want you to be a crusty Christian. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Praise God. He doesn't want you to be crusty. He wants you to have life. And he knows that in order for you to have life, that you're gonna have to believe. And sometimes, sometimes it helps for you to have a miraculous sign where God shows up and does something amazing in your life. Because, and I believe this for all of us, and it shouldn't be once, it should actually be regular. Where we pray, where we seek God, we believe him, and he comes through in a way that we say, only God could have done that. That's what we talked about last week with Vision Weekend. We talked about how God has provided for us. And, and, and I talked about how he provided the community center, and then he provided North Campus, and then he provided South Campus, and then all along he was working to provide Lee Summit first and this great merger coming together. And it's because he's doing stuff all behind the scenes, and he's always working. And it's important that we look back and say, God, you have done this. And when it, why it is so important is because there will be moments that you face difficulty in your relationship with God moments where you face discouragement or doubt in your relationship with God but when you look back and say God you came through for me there you came through for me there you came through for me there you came through for me here and God by the grace of God you're going to come through for me again that's what it does it stirs your faith it stirs your faith you start recounting miracles you pray you believe and man he came through for you like I can't not believe. And let me just say, let me just say, man, our world needs this today. Our world needs this. There's so much confusion and so much doubt, so much discouragement, so much depression. We need the hope of God. We need the life of God as demonstrated, come on, somebody, by the power of God. And that leads me to the next thought, which is this. God wants us to walk in power. He doesn't want you weak. He doesn't want you surviving. 
He doesn't want you just getting through your Monday so that you can get through your Tuesday. So you can so you just mindlessly, he doesn't want that for you. He's made you for life. So he wants to show his power in your life. Now, let me just break this down. There, there are really two elements to spiritual living. There's wisdom, and then there's power. Supernatural. There's natural and supernatural. Wisdom is like the way things work. It's, God has created the world in such a way that when you, we've talked about this when we did our Proverbs series. When you, when you find what he says is hakmah, which is like the needle and thread, God has woven wisdom into the world. And when you find his wisdom and you go along with his wisdom and do what he is, well, how he's created the world to work, it's going to go well for you, generally speaking. So like if you don't steal from your neighbor or if you, if you give generously or if you live a life that where you uh, save more and spend less, those are wisdom principles and they matter and it's important. Counseling, that's important. There are certain things that work and there's certain things that don't work. So he's created us for that, but he's not just created us for wisdom. He's also created us for power. Because he is a powerful God, he wants to powerfully move in our life and he wants to powerfully flow through our lives. This is, this is who God is. I mean, again, look at the beginning of creation. He creates the world, it's explosive. It's explosive, it's powerful. When Jesus is born, powerful. His miracles, powerful. That's the power of heaven coming down. And this is what we need to be as a church. This is, this is what the world is longing for. They're longing for a powerful church. A church that meets them where they are and says, hey, you know what? I know you're going through something difficult. Let me pray for you. And that's gonna, I'm going to blow your mind with something. What if this week... You just approached it saying, man, I can't wait to let the power of God flow through me. That's what the world is looking for. That's what the world is needing. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this. He, and what Paul is talking about in this is he's talking about the last days and how in the last days, people are going to be cray. That's literally what he says. He's like, people are going to go crazy. 2 Timothy 3 is like, they're going to be all kinds of stuff. It's going to be, it's going to, how many think we might be living in the last days? The world has gone a little crazy. One of the things he says is that part of the craziness, even in the believers, is that they will have a form of godliness, but will deny its power. Man, it sounds a lot like a lot of churches. It sounds a lot like a lot of Christians. It's, it's what can happen. See, God, has ne God, did never, God never created us to go through motions and to follow rules. He, can, he, he created us to be connected to the power source. That's what he created us for, to powerfully move in our lives and to, and to powerfully flow through our lives. Look at what Jesus does with the disciples. Matthew chapter 10. He called his disciples to him and gave them authority. Everybody say authority. Every time you see the word disciple in the New Testament, that was someone who lived back then, but you know what that truth is? That truth is for you today. So if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a follower of God, you're like, man, I want God to move in my life, you are now a disciple. And so because you are a disciple, you're a follower of God, you can have authority. He has given you authority to move powerfully in this world to drive back darkness. Let me show you this. He gave him authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. He's given us authority. Why is he giving us authority? Because the kingdom of God is life and joy and peace and truth and freedom. The kingdom of darkness, think about this, right? Is, is, is disease sickness, weakness, infirmity, darkness. God has called us to bring light to that darkness. Jesus did amazing things. 
And we saw that in John's gospel. It's like, man, if everything was written down, well, I didn't, I, we didn't look at it, but you can trust me, or you can go look at it for yourself. End of John's gospel. He said, if everything was written down, there wouldn't be enough room in the whole world to contain the books. So many more signs that Jesus did. Watch what Jesus says in that same gospel, John chapter 14. He says, very truly, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things. Everybody say greater things. Greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Watch this. And I will do whatever you ask. Everybody say whatever. Everybody say whatever. (laughs) Whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Does he say, uh, you can ask me for some things, you can ask me for a few things, you can ask me for like the really important things? No, what does he say? Anything. Now let me just ask you this, when Jesus says anything, what do you think he means? Anything. I mean, it's just the Bible. And you know I'm big on this. If we believe, if we believe this, then let's believe this. God wants to use you to do greater things. This is the mission. This is the mission of God. God doesn't want you just to exist. God doesn't want you just to go through motions. He doesn't want you to play church, to just show up for life group. He wants you to powerfully affect and infect culture with the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the power of Jesus Christ. What is that power? What is that power? Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, he's beginning his ministry. This is at the beginning of his ministry. And he's getting ready to start. And he, and he goes to the synagogue, which would have been kind of like church, a little church service. Not the temple. It would have been like a, a, a smaller building. They're getting together, just a few people, having church. And he's a rabbi, so they hand him a scroll from Isaiah, and he reads it. So this is an Old Testament prophet, and he's getting ready to read it. And it's from Isaiah chapter 61. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. This is from Isaiah. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolls up the scroll. Now, people would have done this. People would have done this. But Jesus rolls up the scroll and then everyone's looking at him. Eyes everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled. Basically saying, the healing that you need, it's here. The freedom that you need to experience, it's here. The brokenness that exists in our world today, the healing for that is here. The end to that is now. Jesus says, you've been waiting for that? Guess what? I'm here. Let's go. And then what does he do? He goes and he heals and he sets people free and he casts out demons and it's unbelievable. He completely changes the world. And then he gets his disciples and says, and you will do greater things? Is that true? I believe that it is. I believe that power that the same power that created the world, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that spirit, that spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says, now lives in us. It doesn't live in a temple. If you are a believer in Christ, it does, it's not in, a, it's not in the, the Ark of the Covenant, all right? Sorry if you like Indiana Jones and you want to go find the lost Ark. There's no power there. Do you know where that power is? It's in you. You are connected to the power source. Now, that's amazing. So that's why all the miracles. Okay, that's the first question. Why don't they happen today? And that's what I want to look at. I want to look at several miracles over the next few weeks and just just talk about it. Just talk about miracles and and why aren't they happening today. The first miracle, just quickly today, I'm going to take just a a quick run at this, is Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. I love Mark's gospel, by the way, just a little side commentary. For all like the action movie lovers, Mark's gospel is for you. 
If you like Marvel, you're going to like Mark. Because <laughs> Mark's all about action. He's all about, and then, and then they did this, and then Jesus went there, and suddenly, and they were amazed. Exclamation point, exclamation point. That's Mark. It's the action gospel. But let me show you this in Mark chapter 9, verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, so, so this is right after the transfiguration. Jesus has changed in the presence of uh, Peter, James, and John, and they all want to hang out up there. And Jesus is like, no, we got to take the power down. And so they, show, they, they come, and, and there's a little fight, Mark chapter 9. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Why? Because he was always doing good stuff. He was always doing something amazing. They wanted to be around him. But Jesus is like, no, no, no. Hey, what were you guys arguing about? And a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. Why not? Jesus tells us, next verse, you unbelieving generation. Jesus says, faith is the problem, or a lack of faith. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus this is what's crazy. Immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It is often throwing him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, can you imagine the desperation of this dad? Can you imagine your own child being possessed by a demon and, and, and wanting and trying to kill himself? This dad is desperate. And he says, if you can do anything, take pity on us. And Jesus is like, if you can, everything is possible for one who what? Believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever like, God, I believe you. Kind of. God, I'm trusting you to do something amazing, and I can't wait, and I'm trusting, I'm believing, I'm stepping out in faith, sort of. That's this guy, and I love Jesus' response because Jesus isn't like, nope, not good enough, take a number, get back to the end of the line, try again, wrong answer, I'm looking for 100%, sure, unquestioned, you need to be all in or all out. Jesus meets this man where he is. And Jesus always does this. He always meets us where we are. He always meets us where we are. Jesus said, or when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit, you deaf and mute spirit. He said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. It was amazing. It was a miracle. And after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this, this kind can only come out by prayer. Now, here's what's interesting about this. It's, well, some versions say by prayer and fasting. Some translations. But you know what Jesus doesn't do in this situation? Pray or fast. It's kind of, I, so I really don't even know what to make of that. But what I do know is what does he get onto his disciples for? Because they couldn't drive it out. Not believing. It's faith. What does, he what, does he get what does he kind of tell the dad? Like, if you can, he's like, hey, listen. Everything is possible for one who believes. Faith is the problem, and faith is the solution. Two reasons we struggle with experiencing the miraculous. Real quick, and then we're going to get ready to pray. Number one, we struggle with believing God for miracles because of our past. I think, I think this dad, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe what happened with his dad is, is he'd gone to 
like a, a school of religion or gone to a synagogue where, where a Sadducee taught. You know, in the New Testament, there's Pharisees and Sadducees. They were the religious leaders. The Pharisees believed in supernatural and the Sadducees did not. That's what made them sad, you see. You'll never forget it. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe this dad, he grew up in a, in a church that didn't believe in miracles. So he never prayed for miracles because he was taught that God didn't do miracles. So maybe, maybe that's why he lacked faith. And maybe some of you are like that today. You grew up in a church and they said, no, God did everything he was going to do in the New Testament. And that ended with the last apostle. I'm like, why? Like, really? Does that even, does that even make sense? Like, I mean, you can, you can do some scriptural gymnastics to get to that point, but I, that's just not the, that's not the history of God. That's not God's nature. That's not how God moves. God still moves today. God still does miracles today. But faith is really key. And so sometimes faith or our, our past is limiting us to believe God for the miraculous. Number two, we struggle with believing God for miracles because of our present. Maybe the situation that you have is so big that you're like, I don't even want to embarrass God. I don't want to make this a thing. Or maybe you've been struggling with it for so long that you're like, and you still have it, and you're just like, he hasn't answered before, so I just don't know if he's going to do it now. I don't want to put God to the test. I don't want to bother God. Or maybe you're just so focused on all of the stuff of life that you, that you just haven't stopped. Or maybe you just haven't had the opportunity. But today you have the opportunity because we're going to pray. And we're going to believe. And we're going to, we're going to ask that God would do the impossible. Because you know, that's what Jesus says. Everything is possible. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. That's the God of the Bible, and he wants to meet us right where we are. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I'm going to ask you to stand as well, if you would, at both locations. I just want us to prepare us for uh, a moment where we're going to spend some time worshiping, and we're going we're gonna to pray for people. We're going to pray for needs, and we're going to pray for everybody's need who wants to come forward today. But back to the lamp illustration. I really believe this is how this works. You can be plugged into the power source. You can have all the potential. You can have the light bulb screwed in. You can be plugged in. You can have a nice lampshade. You, you can be ready for impact. But how many of you know there's one thing that has to happen for that light to unleash its power? It has to flip the switch. It has to flip the switch. Faith is the switch. Faith is the switch. You can be plugged in. You can be connected. You can be ready. You can have all of the potential, but you have to believe. Is God going to answer every prayer just the way we want? No. I, 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 just, I, I, just, don't, I just don't think he's going to answer every prayer just the way we want. I, I just don't know. I just don't, I just don't think that he will. But here's what I'm at. I'm like, God, I'm going to believe you until you don't. I'm going to keep praying and keep asking and keep seeking because my job isn't to determine whether you're going to come through for me or not. My job is to ask and believe. My job is to ask and believe. We're going to pray for people. I'm asking the prayer team to come down to the front if they would. We're going to pray and believe God and, and um, for any type of miracle. Could be a, could be a physical need. We're going to believe that God will heal you in Jesus' name. Could be an emotional need, maybe a broken heart. We're going to believe that God will heal you. We're going to believe maybe it's a favor. You need favor. You need a miracle, a favor, a work situation, a marriage situation. We're going to believe God to move in power. Now, here's let me say. Again, it's wisdom and power, right? Do we need counseling? Yes. 
Do we need uh, recovery programs like Living Free? Yes. But do we need power as well? Also, yes. Let me just say, let me just say this. My dad, a great example of this. When, when we got saved, um, when, I was, when I was young, my parents didn't know any different except just to believe all this stuff. They just went in. They're like, all right, yeah, let's, I'm in. And my dad was an alcoholic, had struggled with alcohol since he could remember. His dad before him was an alcoholic. His dad before him was an alcoholic. Three generations of alcohol. And, and to where it was controlling, life controlling. Couldn't, couldn't go without it. In a church service, my dad came forward. God touched him, set him free, and he never drank alcohol a day in his life again. Amazing. Supernatural. Watershed moment. Watershed moment for him. Watershed moment for you know who else? Me. Because I'm like, well, that's interesting. Because the rest of the family, they're still doing, but you're different. God met him. God met him. Again, I believe in all of it. I believe in all of the recovery stuff, but I also believe in the supernatural power of God. I believe God can set you free from addictions. I believe God can supernaturally change your heart. And we need moments of power infusing spirit working in our lives to change us, to break us out. And God wants to meet us. Another example, before we get ready to pray, our very own uh, operations director, Jeremy Needham, his wife, Danielle, uh, was struggling with an infection in her ear just recently. And uh, in, in, in August, she went in and they're like, hey, yeah, this is going to, if you don't get this taken care of, we have to operate. If you don't get this taken care of, like it's going to continue to eat away at your bone and, and, and you could lose your hearing. So they started praying. They started fasting, started seeking the Lord, got a group of people together to pray, and they've been praying for months and months and months. Every opportunity they had, they went forward for prayer. And then last week, but then the doctor's like, hey, listen, we need to have this surgery. So they're like, all right, let's go. And, the, and before they went in for the surgery, the doctor showed them the x-ray. This is true. The x-ray of the inner ear, the bone, had begun to deteriorate. Look, he's like, look, this is already deteriorating. So they're like, all right, we're going to go in. They go in, have the surgery. The doctor's like, yeah, we cleaned it all out. The bone is completely intact. And Jeremy's like, no, 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 no. You told me the bone was already getting eaten away. He's like, I don't know what to tell you, but the bone is intact. God did a miracle. God did a miracle. And it was so cool. It was so cool for us because we prayed for him as a staff. There were members of the church that had been praying uh, for her and believing God to do something. And we're all like, yeah, watershed, watershed moment. We're like, that's where everything converged and God showed up. God is still in the business of doing the miraculous. Our job is to trust him, to seek him, to turn the switch on and say, God, I believe. So whatever your need is today, I believe God cares about it, and I believe God is powerful enough to do something about it. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray. You're here. You're saying, God, I, maybe it's a, a marriage, financial, physical, emotional, mental. God, you're struggling with anxiety, depression. God can meet you. God can help you. He still does miracles today. Amen? Let's pray. Would you just lift your hands all across this place? South Campus watching online. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a miracle working God. That God, you are still in the business of doing the miraculous. And Lord, we pray that you would do miracles today. We pray that God, you would pour out your spirit. For those that need prayer, Father, we pray you would do it. Do something amazing, something supernatural, something that only you can do. And God, we, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and come down to the front for those who need prayer. The prayer team can spread across the front. For those of you who are sick, we're going to anoint you with oil, just a little drop of oil. The Bible says in James chapter 5, if there are any sick among you, to call for the elders of the church and to anoint them. And that the prayer offered in faith will heal the sick person. The Lord will raise them up. We believe that. 
And we're going to pray that healing will take place in your life and that God will do something amazing. The rest of us, let's just worship. Let's just worship God, and maybe God will speak to you and bring you forward. Maybe you want to come forward and pray on behalf of somebody, but we're going to believe that this will be a house where miracles take place. Let's worship.